few of my friends, you know, people like, um, well, obviously Sid and Johnny Thunders and uh, Jerry Nolan, um, D.G. Ramone, all those people that actually couldn't escape from the lifestyle that they were used to. Um, and I left, um, I, partly to, to look after my mum and dad, because they were getting on, um, partly to save my own skin, really. Um, and I, I broke that link with the people that really, um, some of which didn't survive. Um, luckily in the book here, there's a, a man called Michael Collins who was in, he instigated me working at the shop with Malcolm and Vivian. He um, had reinvented himself and he became um, another person completely. He came very close to dying himself. And, um, you know, so there is, in a way, that disappearance has become kind of a period of mystery, and people don't quite understand, you know, what I was doing. The book explains that very well, um, and it also means that that whole thing wasn't played out for me. I wasn't bored with it. Uh, there wasn't a repetition that went on. Um, you know, I could look at this, write this book with a fresh thought on it. It's a bit like being in a vortex. When you write in the middle of something, you know, you're observing um, vortex, you can't actually see what's going on around, everything's spinning around on you. And um, now I can, felt, you know, a couple of years ago when I decided to write this book, I could see it from outside inwards and look at it with a much fresher eye. And it was, it was um, fascinating actually. I've um, rekindled a lot of friendships that I, lost and of people I'd forgotten about. So it's been a very cathartic thing writing the book. Very um, upsetting also because I've learned things about my family and, you know, bared my soul in it. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I feel like um, something has been lifted from my shoulders by telling this story. Um, I don't know whoever's read it already. I hope they've enjoyed it. Um, it's doing very, very well, and I'm glad it is, because um, it was beautifully written. Um, uh, and the style of us writing it was quite unusual. I wanted a lot of social comment in there. And I wanted the people who were there at the time to um, be able to have their voice. Um, I didn't want to just write a book about myself. Um, um, so what I was going to do, I was going to open this up to you. Uh, there's going to be a Q and A. People can ask me absolutely anything that you want. Please don't hold back if you want to to ask me something personal. Um, but also, if you want to hear what uh, is in the book, I was going to ask you to shout out a number. So put your hand up, and I will read the page of whatever the page that you shout out. Nine. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> Early well, it day. Like my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's find nine. Early days. That was a really bold nine. <laughs> <laughs> who was that? Yeah, who was that? Oh, I see. It's the troublemaker. Oh, is that one? Yeah, there's always there's one. Always one. one. Yeah. I was one of those. Probably still am. Okay. So, um, well, actually, I'm going to start with my brother. He's on page nine. Uh, Roger Rook is my brother. And he said, um, I must admit, we were a family who got a little bit dysfunctional. Who's family do? Lights up a little bit. Little bit lights. Lights up. Yarn? Yeah, that's up uh, So, a little bit dysfunctional. Okay. Uh, there was a bit of conflict between our parents. I think Dad would have preferred it if Mum had been a stay-at-home mum. I remember them having, let's say, lively discussions about her going back to work. <coughs> I mean, she was a great mum, she was an excellent cook, really good, did feed us well, proper home cooked food, and she was always darning socks and sewing buttons on. Nothing got thrown away quickly. But I think she really liked the buzz of working in a pub. Oh, <laughs> oh wow, is that in your pocket? This has got bad droop on it, hold on. Yeah. Someone needs to get the screw. Tighten them up. There we are. 
there we go. That's fine. I can actually just shout, to be honest. <laughs> I can learn to shout. Okay. Um, so, just don't, yeah, that's great. Okay, so where were we? Um, my mum liked the buzz of working in a pub. She was a barmaid, my mum. Um, and the banter and liveliness of it all. Um, she was not comfortable with just being at home. She was more aspirational than Dad was, ever. I can always remember them talking about decorating the house and her, um, her saying to him, I suppose you'd be quite happy with orange boxes for tables and jam gels for glasses, wouldn't you? Um, just to fill in the gaps here, my mum never actually really got what she wanted in her life. You know, she ne we never had enough money um, for her to have the right light fittings or the right sofa or things like that. So she was always a little bit, um, uh, I don't know, maybe perhaps a little bit envious and a little bit unhappy about the fact that they didn't have much money. Which actually is very interesting because they did these ballet classes for me and, and you know, they hadn't got hardly any money. So for my mum to, to do that was a, a really big monetary sacrifice. So um, anyway, Dad would take me to the, this is my brother again, Dad would take me to the library every Saturday and on the way back we'd stop at a garage and spend about a quarter of an hour looking at the cars. <laughs> Never had one. Never had one. Oh, I um, love yours. All black and shiny and new. We never had a car, but obviously it did cross his mind. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is really good. You know, pick that as well. This is great. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have a sip of my drink. Right, okay, I don't think it's such a good story, this. I might have to do 90 out of 91. Okay, go for it. Go for it. it. It's a really, really good story. So anyway, um, it was about my journeys on the train from, from Sleepy Sleepy to London, okay? And um, there was a particular gentleman on the train. So one of those suits had a proposition to make. Mr. Hawkins was an old man in his late 70s, pushing 80, um, to my 20 years old who used to do the same journey from Seaford to London that I did every day. He was a director of a listed company on the Stock Exchange and he had lived in Sussex. I noticed him looking at me on the way on the train a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but not necessarily what I was wearing. Um, despite being so provocative, Mr. Hawkins was looking at my feet. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. What's going on? Lights have gone down. Lights. Oh. Mr. Hawkins is the ghost of Mr. Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> it is the ghost of Mr. Hawkins. I'm sure you get it, so do I. <laughs> You're leaning on the light switch. You've got to turn it up because she can't it's see. Sophie, this is not that light. She can't oh, yeah. see. She can't, she can't see. see the fucking book. <laughs> It's looking really dark. Are you changing it? Um, one day, when I was wearing some Vivian Westwood round-toed red patent stilettos, he followed me from the train across the concourse at Victoria Station and stopped me and asked me um, how much he loved my shoes. <laughs> then he asked very politely, could you perhaps come and visit me? <laughs> in the place where I work. <laughs> I did feel like I would be safe with him. Um, so I told him, look, this is the place where I work. Perhaps you would like to come and visit me there um, and first at the shop, okay? <laughs> so he came down the King's Road. He said he had had a flat in London and that he received, the, um, sorry, he 
Then you reeled off the unusual, my wife doesn't understand. (laughs) (laughs) And then he asked me if I would visit him in his pad. (laughs) Um, But I still wasn't quite, well, still wasn't quite sure what, um, sorry, I can't quite say. A bit more light? Light. 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 Yes, yes. Thank you. We're all old, we aren't going to worry. I don't care about that. (laughs) Okay. Um, so, here we go. Um, so I wasn't sure what he was into, whether he just wanted to look at women wearing stilettos or what. So I told him I'd think about it. There was one person I could turn to for advice, which was Linda Ashby. She was a prostitute that I used to share the flat with in, Kings, in um, Buckingham Gate. That's a very famous flat. Um, anyway, she, she would know her stuff about this, I thought. So, and she was a matress um, who bought clothes and accoutrements for the work, for, for her work from sex. Okay, um, Linda's flat at 1016 King's House St. James Hotel and her regular nightclub, Louise's, in Portland Street, would soon become an epicenter for the shop's employees and our friends. Um, and I would end up living at King's House between 76 and 78. She was the one person I knew who would have experienced the likes of Mr. Hawkins. (laughs) I would know how to play the situation. What do I do? I asked her. Um, I don't want to go there on my own. Always up for an adventure, Linda said she'd come with me. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Hawkins is business flat was very old-fashioned, stuffed full of antique mahogany. He greeted Linda and me with glasses of champagne, but before disappearing into another room. (laughs) When he came out, he was wearing a full (laughs) negligee, with a little pair of pants on underneath, and a pair of patent stilettos. (laughs) He was probably about size 12 shoe. It turned out that he wanted to walk around in them in front of an audience. And he was so pleased he got one. After that first visit, he said he wanted to be, uh, he wanted it to be a regular thing. (laughs) (laughs) And offered to buy me a gift in return. I said, oh no, I don't think so. (laughs) Don't worry about that. Um, But he was insistent. I oh, know, I'd really like to buy you something. I know a really nice jewellers in Kensington. I'll meet you outside there and you can pick what you like. I didn't want to take Mr Hawkins for a ride um, or lead him down the garden path, um, or lead him down the road that I couldn't uh, find fulfilling. Um, if I'd wanted to watch him wearing those clothes and shoes, I would have happily done so without being paid. It seemed a bit tawdry and demeaning, so I never turned up. Aww. Did you ever see him again? No. No. No, not no, after that, no. not on the train no. or anything. No, he no. Was he was a really old man. He was, um, he had no hair. He had yellow, really bright yellow, like jaundice teeth. Oh, my God. Um, I know. And, and not also, abusive. Had very bad breath. Oh. And he had a skin complaint as well. Oh. So I guess it's no wonder his wife didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a well kind hearted yeah. man. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I never did think that he was actually going to go into a room and dress oh, up. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, was <laughs> there. He was a big bloke as well. He's yeah. oh. <laughs> not a skinny man by any means. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone else? 23. 23, oh, yes, okay. Right at the beginning of the book. Mm. <laughs> mm. I know, I'm going to say. Mm. Yeah, I'm halfway through. If it's a crap page, I won't do it. Oh, that's <laughs> good. That's fair enough. <laughs> there are no crap. Nothing's crap. No, yeah. It's really good. That's true, yeah. Why did I say that? It's so good. <laughs> okay. um, so this is high school confidential. It's actually the beginning of chapter two. Um, I was a teenage alien, which is 1966 to 1970. Um, by the time I had left junior school, I already knew I was, what I was going to do something different with my life. I didn't pass my 11 plus and went to Seaford Head Secondary, 
where I first met my friend Sally and Gillian Payne, another girl I'd been friends with at the juniors, who often lived up to her surname. <laughs> <laughs> I did really quite well to begin, begin with. Um, I was in the A stream, but it was a real eye opener going from one quite small school to um, at the end of my road to a big comprehensive full of loud, clamouring voices. At times, my secondary school days closely resembled the bash, bash tree kids <laughs> um, and in Vino. I didn't have many friends, but one of the best was Leslie Foster, who would be then, for me, in some crucial moments in my life, there for me, and still remains very close to me this, to this day. This is my friend Leslie talking. <laughs> 